Long ago, in a fictional universe that has varied in quality over the years if we're honest, seven titans born of order were wandering about the great dark beyond, searching for world souls, which are essences of incredible power. Things that can be nurtured into becoming titans themselves. Every time the Pantheon discovered a world with a soul, they would bring order to that planet and put life on it, which in turn would help mould that world soul into what they wanted it to be. However, whilst mooching about in space, one titan called Sargeras came upon a corrupted world soul, tainted by agents of the void, old gods. And he realised very quickly that should this corrupted world soul be allowed to reach maturity, it would be the opposite of what they wanted. A destructive void creature of ridiculous power. And that idea scared the absolute crap out of him, so he went ahead and cleaved the entire planet in half, destroying all life on it. He then returned to his Titan pals and explained what had happened, but instead of crowd surfing him and telling him he was really cool, they reprimanded him, saying that he should be ashamed of himself and that they had all sworn to protect life, not explode it. His lieutenant, Agrimar, did that really annoying thing where he insisted there must be another way without actually providing one, and Sargeras just told them all to shut their goddamn mouths. Hesitation and pacifism would achieve nothing. A dead universe was better than one consumed by the void. The rest of the Pantheon all clutched their pearls and gasped at that statement, and Sargeras kinda cursed them all out and stormed off. Now Sargeras had spent millennia hunting demons, which was kind of his job, and locking them away in a prison he'd built called Mardum. But things had changed, so he decided to shatter that prison and free them all. And with their foul magic, he went out and destroyed a whole bunch of worlds. Until eventually, he was confronted by Agrimar. However, Agrimar was very outmatched against foul magic, so he cheesed it to inform the rest of the Pantheon of what Sargeras was doing. Amonthul, leader of the Pantheon, then approached Sargeras and attempted to reason with him informing the Fallen Titan of a world they'd discovered, Azeroth, with a world soul that possessed more potential than any they'd found before, a world soul that could awaken as the mightiest Titan, defeat the Void Lords and all would be right in the world. Surely telling Sargeras that information was a great idea and would definitely convince him to stop this madness. But Sargeras just told him to shut his goddamn mouth again. He then attacked his brethren, defeating each and every single one of them with fell magic, and then he just left with his army of demons, the Burning Legion, hellbent on destroying every remaining world soul he could find, especially Azeroth. But unbeknownst to him, the magic of one of his titan brothers, Norganon, had ensured the Pantheon spirits actually survived. Now hundreds of thousands if not millions of years later, it had been a pretty chaotic few decades on Azeroth. They'd been invaded by demons, and then the Scourge, and then Deathwing had torn through the elemental plane, causing environmental disasters which literally changed the way zones looked. It was only through the combined efforts of Azeroth's greatest champions and the remaining four dragon aspects that Deathwing was defeated. Although, the dragon aspects did have to expend what remained of their titan granted powers, thus beginning the age of mortals, because the dragons weren't going to be able to do much anymore. But with each crisis, the people of Azeroth managed to put their differences aside and achieve narrow victory only to then forget all of that and wage petty wars against each other. Nothing at all seemed to break this cycle of world-threatening chaos, and then unity, and then faction wars. And the only other thing to remind people of before we get to the panda stuff, Sylvanas. She'd fought valiantly against the Scourge in Quel'Thalas, but Arthas Menethil, soon to be the Lich King, stabbed her, and then raised her as an undead banshee. And he bloody loved doing that as well because she'd really pissed him off. Sylvanas was then forced to serve the Lich King's army, murdering the very people who'd once been her friends and allies. However, when Illidan led an assault on the Frozen Throne, the Lich King was severely weakened, as was his control over Sylvanas, her fellow Banshees and a bunch of other undead folk as well. And when the Lich King re-emerged years later, Sylvanas and her Forsaken actually fought alongside the Horde, Alliance, Ebonblade and Argent Crusade in their final charge at Icecrown Citadel. But Sylvanas was not the one to deliver the final blow against the Lich King, and she wasn't exactly pleased that Bolvar Fordragon had taken on the Helm of Domination either. As far as she was concerned, the Helm should have been destroyed. Who cares if there must always be a Lich King? But still, with her vengeance somewhat achieved, Sylvanas decided to go ahead and jump off the building. There was little left for her in the Realm of the Living. She just wanted some peace in the next world. 
Unfortunately, Sylvanas did not find peace in the next world. She found herself in the Moor, a torturous wasteland that no one likes. A place reserved only for the most irredeemable souls in the universe, including Arthas. So as you can imagine, she was ever so slightly disgruntled. However, she was then approached by a dark and mysterious entity that no one likes called the Jailer. Claiming to be an Eternal One, which are leaders of the many realms of the Shadowlands, the bald nipple boy explained that he'd been banished by his kin and bound to the moor itself. The whole system was unjust. A cold and detached Eternal One, known as the Arbiter, was assigning souls to their afterlives without any regard for that soul's desires. Just look at the draw. Some souls went to beautiful, serene places, others shitty places. He then suggested the two of them join forces, assemble an army to wage war on the Eternal Ones, destroy the Arbiter, and reshape the cycle of life and death into something fair and better. And that plan sounded great to Sylvanas, though she was a little bit suspicious that this bald nipple boy was hiding something maybe. So she asked him for proof of his intentions, and he shared five prophecies which would aid her in the days to come. A fiery darkness would return. She would step out of the shadows and lead. A blade would pierce the heart of the world. She would hold the blood from that wound in her hand and sense its power. And finally, she would topple a king and shatter the sky. As one additional gesture of how totally trustworthy he was, the jailer bound a bunch of Valkyr to Sylvanas, who would sacrifice themselves in her stead should her life be threatened. Or, alternatively, she could also use the Valkyr to raise new Forsaken. One Valkyr, called Anhilde, then sacrificed herself in that very moment in order to take Sylvanas' place in the moor. And boof! The Dark Ranger was returned, back to the land of the living. And that's it for the introduction. Now the panda stuff. Thirty years after the Dark Portal had opened, War Chief Garrosh Hellscream had not wasted any time before taking advantage of the chaos wrought by Deathwing's Cataclysm, seizing a whole bunch of new territory for the Horde. However, a lot of people disagreed with this. Obviously the Alliance weren't happy about it, calling for his arrest, but a few Horde peeps were quietly unhappy with their War Chief as well. Firstly, Vol'jin, the leader of the Darkspear Trolls. He was bloody disgusted, ordering his Darkspears to leave Orgrimmar and return to the Echo Isles, whilst he stayed in the Horde capital just to keep an eye on things. The Tauren High Chieftain Bane Bloodhoof also did not like Garrosh, and never really had, considering the Orc had killed his father Cairn in a duel. Lothamar of the Blood Elves disapproved, and Sylvanas just didn't really give a shit. She probably wasn't his biggest fan though, because he'd called her a bitch in 2010. However, none of these Horde leaders openly threatened rebellion against Garrosh himself. He was well known for abruptly silencing any opposition. There was really only one person who could possibly do something about this situation. The last great leader of the Horde, Thrall. Unfortunately, he was busy, shamaning. After the Cataclysm, he'd buggered off to the Maelstrom, laboring tirelessly alongside members of the Earthen Ring to repair the damage dealt to the Elemental Plane. It was pretty important work that was preventing a second Cataclysm, so he couldn't really be dragged away from that. But as a result, there was nothing to stop Garrosh from pushing his forces on the Alliance outpost of North Watch Hold, with the intention of advancing towards Theramore Isle. Now the leader of Theramore, one Lady Jaina Proudmore, was not a big fan of that. She called upon the Alliance to send whatever resources they could make a big show of force and intimidate Garrosh into standing down. And the Alliance agreed with that idea, so they all sent generals and troops across the Great Sea. Even the Kirin Tor, who were usually kind of neutral, sent a bunch of mages, including my favourite sassy wizard, Ronin. However, this was actually playing right into the War Chief's hands. He was hoping for a strong response. Now his enemies were all in the same place. And what his enemies didn't know was he had a mana bomb forged from an ancient artifact known as the Focusing Iris. As soon as the Alliance forces had amassed in Theramore, Hellscream went ahead and dropped his bomb, annihilating nearly every single person in that city in an instant. Only reason Jaina survived is because Ronin pushed her through a portal, but she didn't escape completely unscathed. Exposure to the blast made her hair white, which isn't really that big of a deal, but the trauma of the event, the anger, the survivor's guilt, etc. That obviously made her a slightly less cheerful person in general. But with that objective accomplished, Garrosh was then able to conquer almost the entire continent of Kalimdor, pretty much overnight. 
Jaina made her way to the Eastern Kingdoms, first to the Kirin Tor, and then to King Varian Rin of Stormwind, urging them to launch a full-scale attack against the Horde. But that idea was rejected unanimously. The loss at Theramore had been devastating to Alliance forces. They needed time to heal and regroup. And that wasn't what Jaina wanted to hear. So she went back to Theramore and retrieved the Focusing Iris, then head to a place off the coast of the Barrens called Frey Island, and then used the Iris to enhance her own arcane abilities, enslaving a bunch of water elementals so that she could launch a tidal wave large enough to cover the entire Horde capital. Meanwhile, at the Maelstrom, Thrall received a vision from the elements about this upcoming disaster. He immediately head out, locating Jaina just in time, agreeing that Garrosh's actions were wrong, but also pleading with her to not massacre an entire faction capital city. But that didn't really work. As far as Jaina was concerned, Thrall was just as responsible for everything that had happened. He'd put Garrosh in charge. Her father was right. Orcs are monsters. And she unleashed her tsunami. Thrall was then forced to do a whole bunch of shamaning, holding the tidal wave at bay whilst also defending himself against Jaina's attacks. And for a moment, it looked like Thrall was actually in a bit of trouble. But the blue dragon Caligos then arrived and managed to convince Jaina to stop being so stupid. Now, whilst all of that shit was going on, the bulk of the Alliance's navy had been assembling in the waters around Orgrimmar, attempting to prod at the city's defences and break the Horde's naval blockade of Kalimdor. And the Horde had summoned a bunch of Krakens in response, who were in the process of annihilating that large Alliance naval fleet. So rather than using the water elementals to drown Orgrimmar, Jaina used them to attack the Krakens instead, rescuing the Alliance navy. And as a result of that heroic deed, Soldiers of the Alliance were then able to make landfall and retake Northwatch Hold. So when Jaina returned to the Eastern Kingdoms, she wasn't arrested for almost doing a war crime. She was bloody promoted to the rank of Archmage and head of the Council of Six, which had been Ronin's seat before he'd been exploded. But as the new head of the Magic Council, Jaina officially had to take a neutral stance on the war. She most certainly didn't do that though. In private, she was definitely not impartial at all. Back to thousands of years ago, when the Titans first visited Azeroth, they found the planet uncorrupted, but under siege by four powerful old gods. In order to prevent the old gods from spreading their darkness to the world soul, the Titans created new beings called Titan Keepers and provided them with a portion of their power. However, the greatest of the old gods, called Yasharaj, I wanted to say Yasharaj, but I won't, was quite tough even capable of corrupting Titanforged, which were beings that the Titan Keepers themselves had empowered. In an act of desperation, Amenthal tore Yasharaj from the surface of the world. And whilst this did defeat the old god, it also did quite a lot of damage, irreparably scarring the planet and creating what would become known as the Well of Eternity. But also, bits of Yasharaj's corpse fell back down to the planet's surface and caused some havoc too. The Titan Keepers traveled around, gathering up the most powerful of these corpse bits, pieces like the heart of Yusharaj, burying them deep underground, but smaller pieces of the old god gradually incorporate themselves into features of the planet itself, and over hundreds of years, an entire new civilization formed atop these small fragments, a place that would later be known as Pandaria. One of the Titan Keepers, High Keeper Ra, tasked his stone servants the Mogu with watching over this land, guarding it against corruption, but as time wore on, the Mogu began to fall influence to another old god, yogg -Saron. Its curse of flesh turned their form from that of stone to flesh and bone and fatty deposits. And then they started warring with each other for a very long time, in a period called the Age of a Hundred Kings, until eventually a powerful conqueror emerged, whose name was Lei Shen. He wanted to continue the work the Titans had set his people to, but upon tracking down High Keeper Ra, he discovered the bloke had just kind of given up. So, he incapacitated the Lazy Knob, imprisoning him beneath his throne, stole his power and became the Thunder King, and then subjugated the other races of the land, the Pandaren, Hosen, Jinyu and Mantid, forcing them all to serve the Mogu. Through an alliance with the Zandalari Trolls, Lei Shen learned of secrets about the land. For example, Titan machinery located beneath Uldum called the Forge of Origination, a weapon that would allow him to reshape Azeroth in any way he saw fit. So he assembled a massive army and marched on the place. The Tolvir, guardians of Uldum, weren't big fans of that, 
but were also severely outmatched. So they turned to the Forge of Origination on Lei Shen and his forces. And that wasn't the best idea they'd ever had, because every creature in the surrounding area was instantly killed, including the Tolvir. However, with Lei Shen gone, Pandaren monks led the other races of Pandaria in rebellion, and the Mogu Empire crumbled, albeit after another long and bloody war. And then, a somewhat peaceful period of time ensued, with a Pandaren named Shao Hao becoming Pandaria's new emperor. And this period of harmony lasted right up until the Burning Legion's first invasion of Azeroth, the War of the Ancients. That event put the Goosey Boots in Shao Hao, and he started to harbour some doubts about their future. Doubts which the lingering powers of the old gods attached themselves to, causing those negative feelings to manifest into actual creatures called Sha. Shao Hao didn't quite know what to do about that, so he went to see Yulon, the Jade Serpent, and she sent him on a great journey to purge himself of negative emotions. And although he did manage to defeat the Shah, the Emperor realised that he could never truly and permanently be rid of them. For so long as the people of Pandaria possessed negative emotions, the Shah would always return eventually. And ain't nobody got time to fight never-ending battles, so Shao Hao decided to instead lock the evil entities away, beneath the temples of Pandaria's deities, the August Celestials. And he set an order of monks called the Shadowpan to stand guard over these sites. And then, Having purged himself of the evil and negative emotions in his heart, Shao Hao died. <laughs> because life was too positive and great now or something. As his physical form disappeared, he broke the land away from the continent of Kalimdor and cloaked the entire region in thick mist, shrouding it from the rest of the world. For the next 10,000 years, the people of Pandaria had nearly zero contact with the outside world. Only a few Pandaren dared to venture away from their homeland, wandering explorers that formed a community atop the back of a giant turtle called Shenzin Tzu, and then set sail across the world. And over time, those explorers of the Wandering Isle returned to Pandaria less and less, eventually losing touch with their homeland completely, until the Cataclysm stuff happened, at which point the Isle started to drift back towards their ancestral homeland for some reason. Now, after the destruction of Theramore and the near drowning of Orgrimmar, there were a whole bunch of naval battles between the Horde and Alliance, and as those armies drifted further and further south, they began to encroach on the waters which Shenzin Tzu tended to swim around in. It was only a matter of time before one of them discovered the Wandering Isle, but what actually happened was they both did at exactly the same time, because an Alliance gunship called the Skyseeker, which was carrying Horde prisoners, got caught in the thick mist surrounding Pandaria and crashed right into the turtle. And in that chaos, the Horde prisoners managed to escape. Meanwhile, the Pandaren on the Isle realised that something was wrong with Shenzin Tzu, so they spoke with the giant turtle, and in doing so, encountered both Horde and Alliance survivors. A conflict between the two factions then ensued, and the Pandaren sort of took sides. One group of pandas, led by Acer Cloudsinger, decided they liked the cut of the Alliance's jib. Following a philosophy known as Tushwe, they valued diligence and morals, qualities they saw in the Alliance leaders whilst the other contingent of pandas followed a philosophy known as Hua Jin, which was more about honour and action and passion. They were led by a bloke called Ji Firepaw, and they decided the Horde were cooler. But despite this new fracture, they were all still mostly concerned for Shenzin Tzu. The crash of the Sky Seeker itself had wounded the Great Sea Turtle, and even worse than that, it was now drifting towards the Maelstrom, which wouldn't end well for any of them. So the faction set aside their differences for a moment, and tried to put their heads together to come up with a solution. But, whilst Acer tried to think of a safe method of removing the debris sensibly, G. Fireport decided it was a much better idea to just blow the ship up. So he went ahead and did that, which did remove the debris, but also wounded Shenzin Tzu even more. The Great Sea Turtle was now dying, as opposed to just in pain. But, again, the Horde and Alliance banded together, albeit aware that G. Fireport might be a moron now. Together, they protected Horde Druids and Alliance Priests long enough for them to heal the Great Turtle, and eventually, everything was fine. G and Asa then parted ways, accompanying their new allies back to their respective capitals to pledge allegiance, and that was the starting zone of both Horde and Alliance Pandas, in a nutshell. Days before the Skyseeker crashed, a little tiny Pandaren named Lee Lee Stormstout did a little tiny quest on the Wandering Isle. A fisherman in her community discovered an ancient artefact called the Pearl of Pandaria. And when Lili touched the pearl, 
She had a vision of a faraway land cloaked in mist. And she was a very clever small child. So she decided this Pearl of Pandaria was the key to rediscovering their lost homeland, Pandaria. She took a boat and set off, with her uncle Chen stormed out seeing her do this and fearing for her safety, so he went after her. After a bit of a journey, the two actually did find Pandaria. However, a violent storm then blew them completely off course, throwing Lili overboard. Both Lili and her uncle were rescued separately by scouting warships, one horde and one alliance. But those rival ships then engaged in battle, damaging each other so much that they both sank. However, Lili and Chen then managed to reunite and swim away from that nonsense, eventually washing up on the shores of their actual destination. Although they'd finally arrived, they were both a little bit uneasy. That had been a pretty traumatic experience. The naval war they'd just encountered was deeply concerning, considering it was happening pretty much on Pandaria's shores. Their homeland would not remain hidden much longer, especially since the mists themselves appeared to be parting. Great change was on the horizon. Sure enough, the First Alliance vessels arrived shortly after that. A fleet of warships led by Admiral Taylor and accompanied by Prince Anduin Rin had been sent off course by the mists, crashing into the shores of the Jade Forest. They had no way to contact the rest of the fleet, so they began setting up camps in the area. The disappearance of the prince was publicly kept quiet, but obviously the King, Varian, was ever so slightly concerned. He ordered Sky Admiral Rogers and her SI-7 agents to take the airship, the Skyfire, and bloody find him. But word of this alliance expedition quickly reached the Horde, and in response, Garrosh ordered his most trusted general, Nazgrim, to launch a similar expedition. Both factions found Pandaria and quickly established footholds within the Jade Forest. However, the intense battles between them caused the Shah to start manifesting, and this drew the attention of the leader of the Shadow Pan, one Taran Zhu. He met with the leaders of both factions and wove a spell to free them from the influence of the Shah before buggering off. But he did have a few parting words to say before he left. Piss off. However, both the Alliance and the Horde did the opposite of that, venturing further into the Jade Forest. There they found allies among the other people of Pandaria. The Horde came upon the Hosen, whose culture centred around hunting and throwing shit at each other. And the Alliance found the wise and grounded Jinyu, who loved talking to water. Whilst both factions rapidly accumulated power in the region, the Horde had a bit of an advantage that the Alliance was unaware of. Prince Anduin Rin had wandered off from the site of his initial shipwreck, completely oblivious to the fact he was headed directly towards contested territory. And Anduin wasn't the only person who was having a little explore, because all the players had wandered off into the Jade Forest as well. And through interactions with locals, the champions of both Alliance and Horde learned the tale of the Serpent's Heart. Long ago, during the reign of Lei Shen, the Thunder King, the Jade Serpent Yulon had become a bit of a ray of hope for the Pandaren. She could not sit idly by as the Pandarians suffered under the Mogu Empire, so she empowered the Pandaren by giving them knowledge and stuff. But this drew the attention of the brutal Lei Shen. He wasn't happy that Yulon was educating his slaves, so he took a bolt of lightning and struck the serpent, causing her to crash into the Jade Forest below. However, some Pandaren found her, wounded and dying, and they moved her to a place of safety, a place where the Pandaren worshipped the August Celestials. And touched by their devotion, Yulon imbued this chamber with celestial magic. She then asked the Pandaren to build a big statue in her likeness, so they went ahead and spent the next hundred years doing that, and the moment it was finished, she died. However, her life essence then entered the statue, and poof, she was reborn. This was not a permanent fix for the wound inflicted by Lei Shen though. Every 100 years, her life force had to be renewed by the people of Pandaria, by completing this same ritual. Thus, once a century, the Pandaren would get together and build a great jade statue at the Serpent's Heart Sacred Temple, and Yulon would then transfer her essence into said statue so that she could be renewed. This process of rejuvenation came with some risks though. If the Pandaren ever failed to complete the statue in time, Yulon's spirit would be lost forever. But the Jade Serpent had unyielding faith in the Pandaren. She believed they would never fail at their task. What she hadn't considered though, was a bunch of outsiders arriving and waging war across the entire Jade Forest. The latest Great Jade statue was on the verge of completion, but the Horden Alliance decided to have a big battle right at the foot of it, and in doing so, toppled the damn thing. 
which only triggered further hatred in the combatants and despair in the Pandaren. And it just so happened that this statue also held another important purpose. It protected the seal which bound the Shah of Doubt. And with all the lovely doubt and negative emotions within the region now, the Shah broke free, fleeing to claim the Temple of the Jade Serpent as its own. Fortunately, heroes from both factions stormed the temple and killed the twat, so that was dealt with pretty quickly. However, there was still the matter of Yulon needing a new statue pretty fast. But the Jade Serpent put her needs aside and informed the champions of a much greater threat on the horizon. The mist that cloaked Pandaria had parted for a reason. There were dark forces at work. The Shah was slowly but surely spreading their corruption across the entire continent. It was they who were amplifying the Horden Alliance's hatred, driving them towards bloody and unnecessary conflict. If this war was ever going to end, the Shah needed to be defeated. As a little side note, there were seven Prime Shah, each fueled by specific negative emotions. Doubt, anger, hatred, despair, fear, violence, and the most insidious of them all, pride. Pride had been the only emotion which Xiao Hao had never fully defeated. In fact, it had been pride's influence which had driven the Emperor to cloak Pandaria and hide the continent away in the first place. Back to Anduin again, the young prince encountered a bit of trouble with Hosen at one point, only to be rescued by Ren Whitepaw and his daughter, Lena. And these Pandaren rescuers then informed him of legends of a mystic valley deep within the continent, the Vale of Eternal Blossoms. The waters of this legendary vale were said to have made the crops in the Valley of the Four Winds grow to enormous size, and they also held the power to heal and even rejuvenate the dying. This absolutely fascinated Anduin. Shortly afterwards, SI-7 agents sent by Varian located Anduin and offered him safe passage back to the Eastern Kingdoms. But Anduin refused. If the legends of the Vale of Eternal Blossoms proved true, those waters would be an invaluable resource for the entire world. Not just the Alliance, all of Azeroth. He then managed to give his father's agents the slip and buggered off. Shortly after that, he was captured by Nazgrim's forces, but again, managed to escape during the chaos of the Battle at Serpent's Heart. He then fled into neutral Pandaren territory, continuing on to Zhu's Watch, and then to the Temple of the Red Crane, just kind of wandering about desperately trying to find the legendary Vale. And that brings us to the Krasarang Wilds for a bit. In a zone located southwest of the Jade Forest, a strange lethargy had taken hold of the people at Zhu's Watch. Just moping about, not interested in anything, and kind of rude if I'm honest. The champions of the Horde and Alliance arrived, and obviously thought this was weird, so they intervened and attempted to cure said lethargy, facing a bunch of Shah creatures. After that, the people of Zhu's Watch mentioned that their courier to the Temple of the Red Crane had gone missing, and asked for a bit of help there. And in doing that, the champions met with some other expeditions. Taranda Whisperwind of the Alliance had received visions of some light hidden beneath the wilds, and Lawkeeper Veldrin of the Night Elves had heard tales of some pools of youth, and thought maybe that was the thing that Taranda was having visions of. It was a long lost Holy Mogu site, filled with pools of light with restorative powers. It was said that Mogu who drank from its waters were granted eternal life. Sounded exactly like what Taranda was having visions about, but for some reason most of the other Night Elves thought, nah, that's not it. Veldrin, however, thought this was too big a thing to just ignore, particularly since the Night Elves had lost their cherished immortality. So he head to Pandaria to investigate, only to fall into a Mogu trap which landed the entire expedition in a big purple dome prison. Fortunately for them, Alliance players arrived. They rescued Veldrin from this trap and then helped the bloke discover the pools of youth. However, they were not exactly what had been promised. They could not grant life everlasting, only transfer life from one entity to another. Meanwhile, the Horde had also had some visions. Sunwalker Dezko led his expedition to Pandaria after experiencing dreams of a peaceful valley of golden blossoms. His Pregger's wife Leza had even witnessed the path they should follow to get there, which led them to Krasarang Wilds. Both the Tauren expedition and the Night Elves watched each other suspiciously, very nearly coming to blows after both sides killed the other's scouts. But they didn't really get a chance to enter into all-out battle, because the jungle was filled with dangerous creatures and hostile Mogu. Both sides suffered heavy losses. Leza dying in childbirth. One of Dezko's pals died in a battle against the Mogu. And in that same battle, Veldrin lost his daughter as well. It was in that moment that the expeditionary forces realized their only hopes for survival were to cooperate with each other. So they joined forces. 
faced down the Mogu together, and rescued a few peeps that had been captured as well. However, upon retrieving his daughter's body from the battlefield, Veldrim went ahead and drank his sample of Paul of Youth water, transferring his entire life force, dying so that his daughter could live. So that was sad. And whilst both sides tended to their dead, the champions just buggered off to carry on levelling. During this little adventure, they discovered the body of the courier they'd been tasked to find, and decided to finish that courier's job for them by delivering the thing to the temple. But upon arrival, they saw a dark energy had taken hold of the place. The Shower of Despair had escaped its prison below, and was possessing Chiji, the Red Crane. So again, the champions of both Horde and Alliance got involved. They rallied the temple's defenders and charged, defeating the Shah and freeing the Red Crane from its influence. But not without heavy losses. Many brave Alliance, Horde and Pandaren heroes were killed in the process. This Shah had been much tougher to vanquish than the Shah of Doubt. But hey ho, two of them were dead now, so that's great. Next, the Valley of the Four Winds. The Alliance and Horde heroes continued to move inland, discovering a lush land full of farms and giant vegetables. The people there led mostly quiet lives, though they weren't completely free from conflict, because to the west of the valley was the Dread Wastes, home to the Mantid, an insectoid race descended from the Old Gods. Every hundred years, a massive generation of Mantid would hatch, driven solely by the instinct to kill and eat. Now, in ancient times, Lei Shen had ordered the construction of the Serpent Spine, which actually stretched across the length of the entire continent, but also served to protect the western border of this valley. Wasn't a benevolent act though, Lei Shen had forced the people of this valley to build it, and it had taken several generations to erect. But still, the wall had helped the people of the valley to ward off the Mantid threat every time, ever since. However, with each defeat, the Mantid actually grew stronger and wiser, because they would preserve their strongest warriors in amber, to be awakened in a time of great need. Horde and Alliance champions actually arrived just in time to witness this Mantid cycle play out. Technically, it had only been 90 years since the last attempted invasion, but swarms of the creatures were already pouring over the wall. And since the inexperienced farmer locals had absolutely no chance of fending off the Mantid attack on their own, both factions got involved and succeeded in halting the invasion. However, despite the victory, it was still a bit concerning that the Mantid had launched their invasion a full decade prior to the schedule. Was this connected to the Shah escaping their prisons? Had the war that the Alliance and Horde had brought to these shores disturbed the balance of all life across Pandaria? Yes. Also, in the Valley of the Four Winds, little tiny Li Li Stormstow had another little tiny quest. After she and her uncle Chen had arrived on the shores of Pandaria, they'd made their way inland, searching for signs of long-lost familial ties. And what bigger sign could you possibly find than an entire brewery that had the same name as you? The Stormstout Brewery had been renowned as the best in all Pandaria, but in recent years, it had fallen on hard times, because it was being run by an incompetent moron called Uncle Gao. Thanks to that idiot's mismanagement, the entire place had become overrun by hoes and brutes, as well as aggressive little rabbit jerks called vermin. However, Chen, with a little help from some of the players, managed to drive away the squatters and restore order to the brewery. And thanks to Chen being a brilliant brewmaster, all was right in the world, and the brewery itself could thrive once more. Next up, the Yorngol invasion. Due to the sheer amount of injuries and losses during the Battle of Serpent Spine, the main forces of the Alliance and Horde evacuated to Binan Village in Kunlai Summit. The village was said to house the finest healers in all Pandaria, so that seemed like the best place to go. General Nazgrim and Admiral Taylor actually shared quarters in the village, which they weren't big fans of, but they ordered both of their armies to stop the fighting and build encampments. The Pandaren of Kunlai's summit requested assistance during this time because their nearby village of West Wind Rest had recently been destroyed in skirmishes with the Yongol. Now the Yongol actually lived in the Town Long Steppes, a zone located north of the Dread Wastes, but since the Mantid had reawakened prematurely and caught the Yongol somewhat with their pants down, they were forced to retreat from their home into Kunlai Summit, and they were pretty angry about the whole thing, laying waste to Pandaren villages, pilfering resources, and slaughtering people. And since both the Horde and Alliance were kind of desperate to win these neutral Pandaren over as allies, both factions decided to help. And after more bloody battles, they succeeded, pushing the Yongol all the way back beyond the Ox Gate, which was a big gate in the Serpent's Spine, separating Kunlai and Townlong Steppe's borders. 
The final battle at the Ox Gate was pretty epic. Ban Bearheart and a small number of Shadowpan warriors got involved, using big ass explosive barrels and stuff. However, despite winning that battle, those involved were a little bit concerned. The Shadowpan, ever the defenders of Pandaria, had failed to heed a request for reinforcements at the Ox Gate, and that was weird and suspicious. Meanwhile, Anduin Rin continued his search for the Veil of Eternal Blossoms, and that journey had led him to the Temple of the White Tiger. This was where Zhuen, another of the August Celestials, lived. But unlike the other Celestials, Zhuen did not guard over a Sha prison. He guarded over access to the Veil itself. Anyone who wished to see the Veil had to first prove themselves. Not just to him, but to another individual within the temple, one Ji the Harmonious, who led an ancient order known as the Golden Lotus, an order which were basically just agents of the August Celestials, tasked with protecting the Veil as well. Anduin, determined to study those waters, presented himself to Zhuen and Ji, and argued that despite bringing absolute utter chaos to Pandaria, the people of the Horde and Alliance were nice. All they really wanted was the betterment of the world, to heal the wounds recent conflicts had left on Azeroth. However, Taran Ju then arrived at the temple, stating that the gates of the Vale should remain firmly closed. Who gives a shit what the Horde and Alliance's intentions were? Their actions had still brought absolute utter chaos. Zhuen considered these compelling arguments and decided to put Anduin's words to the test. Choose a champion to submit themselves to three trials. If they truly had good intentions, then these tasks would be trivial. So, Anduin went ahead and picked you, or me, or anyone who happened to be doing that quest at that particular moment in time. Zhuen then called forth manifestations of the inner turmoil lurking within Anduin's chosen champion, and said champion fought those things. With every trial, the White Tiger and Ji saw great passion and strength, but also scars from battles past. However, what really swayed them was the champion's capacity for righting wrongs. And so, Anduin passed Juin's test. The White Tiger declared that despite their many, many flaws, the people of Pandaria might actually have something to learn from these outsiders, and agreed to grant entry to the Vale, something which Taran Ju was not happy about at all. The Shadowpan leader stormed off, completely oblivious to the fact his anger was feeding a dark force, stirring beneath his very feet. 